everyone and welcome back. About six months ago I decided to go on a big integral tour through Europe. I realized I had never been to some western countries and wanted to correct that oversight. It took me ages to book the hotels and check for train reservations, plus I had to change my travel plans a few times. But in the end I had my itinerary set and I was good to go. The first country on my list was Belgium and I took the night train from Vienna to Brussels. The cabin was really tiny and only had a space for two beds when the seats were folded down, a small compartment for the luggage at the top and a small wash basin hidden in the corner. I probably only got about two hours of sleep when we arrived in the morning, even though I usually fall asleep in the train quite easily. But that did not stop me from exploring the city. History time. The earliest settlements date back to the Neolithic era. The settlement grew and the city of Brussels was officially founded in 979 by Charles, Duke of Low Lorraine, who set down Brussels' first city charter. She received her city rights 1229 from Henry I. From the 12th to the 14th century, the city grew to become one of the major towns as she specialized in luxury fabrics and exported them all over Europe. Philip III, the Duke of Burgundy, had no fixed court. He moved it between different cities. His court was one of the most splendid in Europe and Brussels flourished. A lot of famous painters like Rohir van der Weyden settled in the city. Philip's granddaughter, Mary of Burgundy, married Maximilian of Habsburg and Burgundy and Brussels went to the Habsburg Empire. During the 16th and 17th century, the Habsburg tried to suppress and persecute the Protestant movement. People fled into the Netherlands and this led to an economic decrease in Brussels. After the Eighty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, the northern part of the Netherlands won her independence and the southern part with Brussels was left under Habsburg reign. Joseph II of Habsburg lost the area in 1790 as Belgium declared herself to be independent. The new form Belgium didn't last long as it was occupied in 1794 by the French and annexed to France until the Wiener Congress in 1815. Afterwards, Belgium came under Dutch rule. In 1830, Belgium won her independence once again and Brussels was made the capital city under Leopold I, the new king of Belgium. During World War I and World War II, Belgium was occupied by Germans both times. My hotel was near the train station midi Sud, which was a bit farther away from the historic city, and I walked about 10 minutes to get there. The first thing I saw was the mannequin piece. Its existence can be traced back to the 15th century. It has been repeatedly stolen, and the current statue is a replica from 1965. I took a wrong turn, and instead of the lace museum, I suddenly stood in front of the Croix de Marc. Not where I wanted to go just yet, but still breathtaking. It's surrounded by opulent Baroque guild halls, the town hall and the Brussels City Museum. The construction for it began in the 11th century, but it was destroyed in 1695 by French army during the Nine Years' War. It was rebuilt, giving the square its current appearance. Every two years, an enormous flower carpet is set up here and it's very popular with tourists. Sadly, I was six days late. See the golden color on the statue? One can clearly see where it has been frequently touched for good luck. Personally, I would never rob a statue. I think it's disrespectful, plus it can cause bacterial infections. After a bit of running around, I finally found the lace museum. And while it was a bit smaller than expected, it had amazing pieces of fashion and lace. I dabble a bit in bob and lace making, but I'm still a beginner and have my highest respect to anyone working on this level. The next thing I saw was the Cathedral of St. Michael and St. Gudula. It's a medieval Roman Catholic cathedral and dedicated to the patron saints of Brussels. It has amazing stained glass windows and the nave is lined with 12 statues of the Apostles. I especially like the Baroque pulpit from 1699. It shows Adam and Eve being expelled from Garden Eden and the Archangel Michael on the top. The Virgin on the top, standing on the crescent moon, and the infant piercing the head of the serpent with a long cross symbolize redemption. I still had a bit of time on my hands and decided to go to the Art Museum Old Masters. It covered the history from the 15th to the 18th century. This is a video made in the museum for the painting Netherlandish Proverbs made in 1559 by Pieter Prochel the Elder. 
It depicts a scene in which humans, animals and objects offer literal illustration of 120 proverbs and idioms. The next day I went to Brügge, which was just an hour away. The train station was on the outskirts of the old city, and as I walked to the historic center, I wondered why it was so quiet. It was 9am and there were almost no people around, and all the shops and most of the restaurants were closed. The city herself was magnificent, no wonder it's a World Heritage Site of UNESCO. And look at these wonderful stepped gables, they were my favorite. Brugge was settled during prehistory and was administered by the Romans and the Franks afterwards. She received her city charter in 1128 and because of her good location she grew big with the trade in wool. From the 12th to the 15th century, the city was the center of Europe's finance and trading. She declined after the 15th century and by the time Belgium got her independence, she was nothing more than a small provincial town. The city is often called the Venice of the North because of the canals. She is well known for her lace and that was actually the main reason I chose to go. This is the Church of Our Lady, but it was closed and I couldn't visit it. It's a gothic church and the oldest parts were probably built in the early 13th century. I would have loved to do a boat ride on the canal, but everything was still closed. I felt a bit like visiting a ghost town. On the Nepomukenes Bridge is a statue of Saint Johann Nepomukenes, a bohemian saint who was drowned in the river Vltava. He is the patron saint of bridges and the third most common statue outside of churches. On the outskirts of the historical city is the Canton Museum, but it was closed. I checked Google and it then dawned to me, today was Belgian Independence Day and most of the tourist spots were closed. Oh no! I went to the next open shop and ate a waffle with strawberries, Nutella and ice cream and thought about what to do in a city that was closed. There was nothing really I could do about it and I just decided to see as much as I could from the city and maybe return another time for the museums. That's the Stadthaus, Burgess City Hall. It was built between 1376 and 1421 and allegedly has a wonderful gothic hall. Next to it is the Basilica of the Holy Blood and lucky for me it was open. It was built between 1134 and 1157 and is one of the oldest buildings in Brugge. The basilica houses the relic of the holy blood, either a drop of blood by Jesus or the sacramental blood wine. The lower chapel was built in the Romanesque style and has very little decoration except for these statues. The upper chapel is in a gothic style with a lot of decoration. It is here that the relic is displayed. It was allegedly brought to the city by Thierry of Alsace after the Second Crusade, but no mention of the relic can be found before 1250. It was probably taken in 1204 at the sack of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade. In 1934, the barrel vault was renovated with the help of the patrons from 1562. It has beautiful stained glass windows made in 1845 and depicts the sovereigns who reigned over the county of Landers. Brugge also has a grotto marked and it was here that the trading commenced during their golden time. On the west and north side are houses with stepped gables and restaurants and some on the ground floor. This is the provincial court. In 1294 a warehouse was built on this site. It was demolished in 1787 and replaced with a neoclassical building but it burned down in 1878. I climbed the spiral staircase to a tower that was 35 meters above the ground. It was so narrow that I almost didn't fit with my rucksack on the back, but the 360 degree view was magnificent and definitely worth the climb. I filmed my descent and just feel claustrophobic watching the footage. Anyone else? I was famished by then and stumbled upon a cute little chocolate place and decided to treat myself. The shop was founded in 1997 and the tea room was so cute. I got the ruby chocolate with extra marshmallows. The shop served the hot milk and chocolate separately and the chocolate cup could be put in as a whole and it was simply delicious. I was bit by an insect on the right arm on the train to Brussels. I don't know why, but insect bites always swell up and grow huge, hence that weird red spot on my right arm. Afterwards I went to the St. Salvador Cathedral and somehow I did not take any pictures or videos from the outside. Um, it was built as a parish during the 9th or 10th century 
and it had undergone multiple changes throughout the history. The stained glass windows were made in the 19th century and the tapestry in the 18th century. On my way back to the train station, I took a more scenic route this time. I saw so many cute ducks and swans. It had been a wonderful day, even though it was rainy and cold and most museums were closed. And I headed back to my hotel in Brussels. Thank you so much for watching part one of my interrail trip. I hope to do part two when I'm back from my part two of my travels featuring Amsterdam. Follow me on YouTube and social media, support me on Patreon and have a wonderful day. Bye!